again. I'm happy to see that you've decided to join me in my little corner of cyberspace once more. In this video, I'll begin to talk through the question of God's existence with you. I'll plan to get to more Christian specifics after this, but it, but it might be that the next dozen or so videos work through issues related to God's existence. Why so much on God's existence, you might ask? Shouldn't we just summarize the proofs, respond to the objections, and move on? I don't think things are quite so simple. If I attempt to persuade you of God's existence by simply working through the proofs, I would be assuming that the only barriers to belief in God are, are mental, such as philosophical objections or ignorance, the antidote then being philosophical retorts in the communication of new information. <laughs> to be sure, that's not not the problem, but it is only a part of it, and not necessarily the most important part of it. There are a million ways, of course, that one might go about this, but I'm, I'm going to elect to work through the question of God in a discursive way that I hope gets at the manner in which the question is, is layered for most modern people. That is to say, the things that interfere with a proper way of approaching the God question operate at different levels, some, some intellectual and some moral, some existential, even in ways that are, are below the level of common conscious awareness oftentimes. And I think if we speak to each of these layers directly, we'll find that we're in a better position to identify where the traditional philosophical arguments help us and function to persuade us. So what are these layers? I'm sure this could be broken down in different ways, but I'd want to identify at least three. First, I, I think that to understand the question of God, it is important for us to get at our, our most basic sensibilities concerning what reality is like. That is to say, who are, who are we who are asking the question? What assumptions do we make? What do we assume a good answer to the question looks like? And why? And, and note that I'm not just asking questions about conscious assumptions, but what some have called embodied or, or tacit knowledge. Uh, there are ways we ordinarily relate to the world and construe it in our imagination that, that slips below our conscious discourse, nevertheless revealed in our mental habits and existential crises. Uh, we might call this layer something like an experiential or existential layer. I don't mean that it is the space of emo sonnet making or Terrence Malick films. I just mean that the, the layer, this is the layer that names our basic interpretive defaults, how we implicitly think reality works and how that impacts our working through the question of God. So let's call that first layer the, the phenomenological layer, meaning that this is just how the world appears or, or seems to us. Under this heading, I will address the, the felt problem of divine absence, as well as why I think modern approaches to the problem of God are under a unique historical pressure to appeal to both the mind and to the heart of man. Uh, recognizing this, let's call the second layer the, the kind of moral or aesthetic layer. Here is the realm of a, of a deeply felt nervousness about assenting to any particular conception of God. Isn't, for instance, the God of the Bible a moral monster? Doesn't religion stifle freedom? Can a God who would sacrifice his son be trustworthy? One might say that this layer is, is one of stumbling blocks, factors that often prevent persons from coming to a belief in God. Finally, let's say that the third layer is the more properly intellectual one, the, the realm of philosophical arguments and objections, and of positive arguments and evidences for the existence of God. As might be suggested by what I've already said, it is, it is likely that this layer is liable to be less persuasive if we don't deal with the stumbling blocks or with the basic sense of how things work that might interfere with weighing the plausibility of those traditional arguments. These layers aren't hermetically sealed off, and moreover, they, they interpenetrate one another. A conclusion of the mind might cause a re-examination of one's experiential default settings, and then one's experiential default settings might uh, cause a re-examination of a conclusion of the mind. But sometimes, even then, with that, that kind of dialogical back and forth, there can, these can be hard to reconcile. And I'll, and I'll try to suggest in a future video why this might be so and how to, how to deal with that. As a, 
Final preliminary comment, it is important to note that in describing these three layers, I'm not describing the world and the concerns of those outside the faith in order to persuade them to come inside the faith. I mean, I, I hope to do that as much as it lies within my own power, which is somewhat little if we're being theologically accurate. But each of the layers I have named described the lived world of those inside the Christian faith as well. That is to say, we struggle with believing in the existence of God in some of our more honest and vulnerable moments for precisely the same reasons that others do. And this is because, well, we might be separated by overt claims from them. We are shaped by and share some of the same tacit default settings relative to what reality seems like to us in an ordinary and day-to-day -day way. And in fact, one of the frequent problems that we have when going over the question of God is that we camp out on ideas alone and fail to address the ways in which we have fairly similar mental habits as our secular neighbors. Another Another way of saying this is that we share plausibility structures with them, ways of filtering what is probable and improbable when we encounter claims about reality. Such things are often more basic and function behind and beneath our comparatively conscious beliefs. For instance, most Christians who believe that God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, really believe that happened in history, would not find it plausible that they could have an experience themselves that God would ask them to sacrifice their own child in a similar way. And if they had such an experience, the vast majority of Christians would rightly figure that they were experiencing a mental breakdown. So we're in this fairly complicated circumstance wherein we believe it's plausible that God did ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, but it's also implausible, extremely so, that God would ask us to do the same thing in our own circumstance. So I, I might talk about the question of human sacrifice in a, in a later video, <laughs> but for now, I'm just trying to point out that on the ground, our plausibility structures function beneath explicit discourse and claims about things we think God has done, that is, that set of beliefs that we're most in touch with. So uh, in the next dozen videos or so, then I, I hope to work through the question of God in that layered way, beginning with the phenomenological side of things, that is the, the way things appear to us first, moving on to uh, the especially moral and aesthetic stumbling blocks that often complicate the question of God for modern persons, and then finally address the properly philosophical and uh, evidential side of the question directly. So let's Let's deal with the most immediate layer first. For the next few videos, I will try to get at the question of God relative to this layer. It, it is here in that phenomenological, the way the world seems to us, it is here that our plausibility structures are the most directly, and I would argue, prominently operative. What the world seems like to us, uh, perhaps most often, demonstrates the felt range of workable options from the get-go. It is here that atheism exists as a kind of background temptation, a, a possible way that things could be, a, a whispering voice that summons us to plant our two feet in the most basic realities in order to escape the vertiginous spiral of intellectual justifications that often attempts, that all, excuse me, that often attends persuading oneself of one's own dogmas. Uh, so let's make the point even more clear here. To speak of uh, of the potential temptation of atheism is to signal interest in why those who are not atheists can still nevertheless understand why it is that atheism might be plausible to someone. To be clear, there, there are plenty of persons who are persuaded for all sorts of rational reasons that God exists and that atheism is not just wrong, but deeply and philosophically incoherent, I count myself among their number, and yet these very same persons might confess to you that the atheist vision of an apathetic universe of a cosmos which reduces to impersonal forces nevertheless retains some psychological pull and continues to kind of resurface as an intellectual item that must be dealt with throughout their lives. If you, of course, if you you don't recognize yourself in this sort of experience, then these videos will possibly be less interesting to you. Something like a a museum exhibit of interesting or at least pitiable people. <laughs> For the rest of we poor souls, I'd like to move even more narrowly within the larger question of atheistic plausibility. <laughs> 
uh, astute listeners will recognize some overlap in this video and in previously published material of mine on divine absence. In any case, I, I could tell a lot of stories which which highlight how this issue has come home to me for come home for me personally. But I think one in particular exposes my own and I suspect our intellectual vulnerability. Uh, I worked in Rockville, Maryland at the time, and I was I was driving home listening to NPR because, of course, that's supposed to make you a smart person. Uh, but anyway, uh, a radio show was on highlighting a, a story about an agnostic or atheist junior high camp. The Christians have all sorts of Bible camps, after all, or religion camps. Why can't you have an atheist camp? It is the 21st century, so what can we do? Uh, in any case, as the as the story was presented, they interviewed one of the camp's attendees, uh, a bright-sounding young lady of 12 or 13, and after a, a bit of back and forth with the interviewer, this young woman was afforded the opportunity to present one of her skeptical missiles, and it went something like this, and I, I'm paraphrasing, mind you. You know, God could totally get rid of all atheism if he'd just show up. I mean, think of it. How hard would it be for the Almighty to, to peel back the clouds every day at 3 o'clock p.m. for God time and say, hey guys, here I am, see ya. If he did that, no atheism. So why doesn't he if we're supposed to believe in him? It might be a bit risky to let you all in, the, in on the secret that the juvenile musings of a 12-year-old girl at agnostic camp actually made me feel a bit dumb, like, uh, <laughs> like Moses doing his serpent thing and then being showed up by Pharaoh's wizards. But, but damn it, I was hit. A seminary student who did nothing but think about religion and atheism schooled by a 12-year-old girl at ACTF camp on the radio. Uh, and of course, the, the story doesn't end there. My world didn't come colliding down. I had all the typical intellectual and not so intellectual reactions, ranging from, from reasons why I knew God existed to more self-assuring reactions that, of course, such reasoning was juvenile. But but the point of this story is not to navel gaze at my own psyche. It is, it is rather to highlight where I suspect a lot of us are at. I suspect that this little dart hits a lot of us in the gut. And what I want to explore in these next few videos is, is why that is. Specifically, why does the experience of divine absence bother us precisely in relationship to this question, the question of God's existence? Why does the fact that God does not show up in a certain concrete manner have any relevance when we're talking about his being? That, for instance, we don't, that we don't see God when we pray, that he often seems distant, that sometimes our, our prayers bounce off the ceiling, and especially for, for suffering people, that sometimes we, we can beg for God to just show himself to us, and he doesn't. All of this causes us to, to feel, or at least be tempted to feel, that maybe his non-existence is the most natural inference. Sometimes the universe, or our experiences, or even getting more concrete, our marriages, or our relationships, feel as though they are lived in the face of a deafening divine silence, and therefore a divine vacuum, all reduced to an indifferent cosmos that is, that is deaf to our prayers, joys, and pains. I say sometimes. This could all, of course, be qualified, but my goal here is to acknowledge and, like the psalmist, give utterance to those moments where it's barely qualified, those moments where belief even in the basic notion that God is at all feels difficult and feels difficult for precisely these reasons. The relationship then between divine, athe uh, between divine absence and atheism might, might seem obvious to us, but but they are not as obvious to the person with a little historical imagination. We need to recognize the distinctively historical character of the problem as, I, as I've stated it. Persons have always struggled, of course, with divine absence in, in certain forms, and there is some degree of continuity between the psalmists, you know, sort of, where are you, God, and our own struggles with atheism. But there's also a significant difference. That, that is to say, neither the psalmist or the ancient Near Eastern pagan or the medieval Catholic or the ancient starving Chinese peasant thought that their unanswered cries to the silent sky had any relevance to the question of whether or not God existed. That God existed was an obvious truth written into the fabric of basic phenomenological and social experience. Charles Taylor helps us to understand the significance of the modern condition in his magisterial and now famous volume, A Secular Age. Taylor argues that the, 
The Middle Ages, for instance, represent a moment in which disbelief in God was simply not plausible. It's not that one could not ask the question of whether or, go, or not God existed in a, in a kind of technical way, as Thomas Aquinas does in his Summa, the- Summa Theologica, but it is that no one's belief in God was suspended atop uh, understanding Thomas's arguments. Even if all Thomas's arguments were refuted, God's existence was still obvious in some very relevant sense. Um, uh, what, what has changed now is not, Taylor argues, that we can no longer believe in God. We can. Uh, we can find reasons for God rationally compelling, but, but what it is like to believe, the experience of believing, is the experience of taking one option among many in respect to the God question. Not believing in God is plausible, or, or, or a living option in the, in the taxonomy of the William James, even if we reject that option. This is profoundly important for our analysis to to live in a world in which belief is felt to be one living option among many living options is simply to live in a world in which an alternative belief is possible, at least psychologically, uh, or or at least psychologically plausible to us, uh, somehow faintly understandable in a way that it simply wasn't to many of our ancestors. So, so for all intents and purposes, our problematic, our, our, our challenge here is a modern one. Uh, that is to say, how is it possible that we can both A, think we have compelling reasons to believe in God, B, even find atheism incoherent or obviously false in some way, and yet C, still feel it to be a living option? Said a little differently, why, do, why does it sometimes feel like it, it takes great effort to believe things about reality that are supposed to be plain and obvious, as though we're, we're holding on to it by an act of will rather than by a passive sense of its obviousness, the way that it's not difficult and it doesn't take a great act of will, for instance, to believe that you're hearing me speak right now? And why, why is the simple fact of divine absence even relevant to such a question rather than a, and a triviality which is related to other questions like theodicy or personal comfort? but somehow seems to have special relevance for questions concerning God's being at all. (laughs) So let me outline how we will work through this in the next few videos. In this video, I will simply, simply name and describe the phenomenon of divine absence more thoroughly. In, In the next video, I'll suggest what, what forces in the last two centuries have made it an especially poignant problem for us and also address alternative interpretations of the relationship. And in so doing, we will be exposed to our own modern plausibility structures in order to interrogate them more precisely. But but self-exposure, while while perhaps deflating atheism's claim to being a default or obvious position, is is ultimately insufficient for dealing with the temptation of atheism altogether. We need something to to replace and to fight that temptation. And so in a final video on, on this particular layer, uh, I'll suggest why it is so important for seekers and Christians to seek a union of their, their mental and affective capacities uh, in order to work through these questions, and also how divine absence is actually an intentional piece of divine communication and, and even rhetoric uh, that human beings actually need in order to fulfill their nature in this historical circumstance. So, We'll describe the experience of divine absence in this video. We'll explain that experience in the next, where it comes from. Uh, and then in that final installment on this layer of the, of the God question, we'll, we'll, address, uh, we'll address how to, how to work through it. Um, that's, the, that's the provisional order for now, at least. So, so the phenomenon itself. God's, God's being and activity are not as immediately obvious as the fact that I am speaking to you right now. And many modern persons feel this to, to be a problem. Because of this, belief is often portrayed as a, as a matter of great intellectual and spiritual effort, whereas unbelief is, is sometimes kind of intuitively felt to be the, the default intellectual position once we, to, to bastardize a psalm, cease striving and know that there is no God. Uh, in one way, one of the most important indicators that divine absence is a crisis for us, kind of counterintuitively, is just the existence of modern apologetics itself. In fact, most of the historical scholarship, interestingly, on the question of the initial emergence of early modern atheism in, in, in Europe and in America, ties its emergence to the felt need of religious persons to defend their faith in the first place. 
one might one might put it this way defending the faith presumes that we need to defend the faith <laughs> and precisely in posturing ourselves this way we make atheism a credible enemy and it enters into the background as a as a potential foe apropos to this then the ethos of much though not all apologetics material uh in in especially in modern times is sometimes kind of anxious and reacted or, or excuse me reactive and, and attempted a sort of intellectual therapy for the for the vulnerable uh, and, and where the apologetic strategy for coping with God's absence is abandoned when it's abandoned, there are many, many recent attempts to carve a space for some subtle religion by, by argument for religious experience or consciousness or maybe for a kind of delighted ambiguity. Surely we can hold on to, to kind of just this one thing, this one slice of our own invulnerable subjectivity. What I'd want to note here is precisely this agitation to preserve the, just this one thing. One gets the impression that that for many for many people, human thought has kind of chipped away at this and that religious fantasy, and that many religious persons have kind of retreated to a smaller and smaller corner. In the final analysis, can we not just preserve our own experience, our own sense that we participate in, in absolute beauty, or must we, must we reduce even this to the, to the goings-on of naturally selected neurons, which ultimately themselves reduce to the accidents of collapsed quantum waves? Uh, it, is, it is precisely because this is the perceived situation that much apologetics writing can be seen as a sort of attempt to sort of take back an area that was previously taken away whether it be fighting evolution with intelligent design and sexy creationism, relativism with absolutes, reason with revelation, naturalism with philosophy, neutrality with presuppositions, etc. And yet, arguably, what none of these attempts can get to, at least essentially, is the, the very sense of fragility itself. At stake in these debates, arguably, is the felt fragility of our deepest identities and truths, which are then surrounded by the hedges of an, an argument, apologetic, a practice. Uh, this felt fragility is manifest, though, I'd argue, in many deconversion narratives, which, which fascinatingly in our culture often work uh, in, in, in this way. Uh, someone converts from the very complex set of claims that is Christianity all the way to atheism or vice versa in kind of one big fell swoop. It's actually not as common, from what I can tell, uh, for people to land in the middle, that, though it used to be that someone might convert uh, to deism or to some lesser heresy that more commonly. <laughs> but there's a sense in the modern discussion that at stake are whole systems, and this means that not only is the center vulnerable, but the whole structure can feel like a, a delicate house of cards, wherein the foundational card is not so much protected by all the cards around it as rendered exponentially more vulnerable for having so many areas of exposure. God's existence isn't just felt to depend upon Aquinas then, but on whether the Bible can be falsified, whether the resurrection happened, or, or whether most, Moses wrote Genesis, as it were. The... To lose belief in this context then often, often feels very much like, like letting go or coming to terms with what can really be known or counted on. This dynamic is, is hauntingly portrayed in the film Higher Ground, the directorial debut of Vera Farminga, which is, which is based upon Carolyn S. Briggs' autobiographical account of her, of her own loss of faith, uh, The Dark World, A Memoir of Salvation uh, Found and Lost. The film does not portray an intellectually or spiritually rebellious woman who quits the church because it was mean. It actually portrays a woman desperate to experience God, desperate to know that all things are in his control, desperate just to, to know that he's there. And what is she met with? Silence. Silence when she suffers spiritual abuse. Silence when her friends, when her friend decays from cancer. Silence when her when her marriage begins to fall apart. Her eventual loss of faith is not felt to be a decision, but a, but a chaste wind that ultimately gets away from her. In short, it, it simply stops seeming real or even plausible. Uh, another version of this can be found in, a, in a, actually a surprisingly deep film, The Grey, starring Liam Neeson. In this film, a, a fairly rustic group of oil men are in a plane crash in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness. 
And like many movies of this sort, the better portion of the film involves their attempt to escape from various dangers. But what makes this story unique, however, are the explicit theological conversations that go on between the characters. Many of them are, are religious, but Nielsen, who had previously watched his, his wife slowly die of cancer, while sympathetic to the impulse to believe, nevertheless cannot bring himself and that's just how I'd want to say it. He cannot even get himself into a place where he can even believe for cathartic reasons. For him, it would be apparently be dishonest. The, the disaster scenario and its beautiful surrounding scenery is a, is a perfect way to communicate a universe that is at once full of wonder, but also full of hostility, the balance of which is the the cosmos's utter indifference to the small, to these small homo sapiens, you know, sort of fun, fumbling around in the snow. At the film's climax, Nielsen looks up into the sky and sort of screams in desperation, uh, do something, do something, you phony, fraudulent, and I won't repeat, this is a family show here, we won't repeat all the bad words. Come on, prove it. <laughs> screw faith, <laughs> earn it, show me something real, I need it now, not later, now, show me and I'll believe in you until the day I, I die, I swear, I'm calling on you, I'm calling on you, and the sky is silent, and so a, a tough Irishman, Nielsen, stands up and says, screw it, I'll do it myself, and yet doing it oneself is not all, does not always work in an indifferent cosmos, as it turns out, <laughs> And perhaps uh, bringing in a third film, though, to make a little trifecta for us here. Uh, no film has captured an indifferent cosmos better than the incredibly beautiful but incredibly disturbing art piece by Lars von Trier, Melancholia. Uh, aptly titled, it is an incredibly depressing movie for those who like such things. The film opens on, on a wedding, but a wedding that is oppressively brooding. It is, it is not for a while that the film viewing audience realizes that this scene, which is supposed to be joyful, uh, is juxtaposed to the wedding participants' awareness that a comet is sort of coming toward the earth and is very likely to kill all living persons. The rest of the film, post-wedding, portrays the bride and her sister in a cottage preparing to see if the comet will, will strike the earth or, or slingshot around it. The, the film, in that sense, is, is full of waiting. Once it becomes clear that the comet will strike instead of slingshot, the sisters build a little teepee in a field and sit in it with their children and just wait. The film is interspersed with incredible scenes of natural beauty and of cosmic wonder, but also of just completely absolute indifference. All the joys and strife of human sentience will pass in a moment like a breath into the void of the cosmic sea. This is at once disturbing, and yet it is not felt, though perhaps thought, by most of us to be insane. It's haunting, and the fact that it has this, but the fact that it has this pull can cause us to, to question everything. How can I be so certain that this cosmic indifference is not the case? Indeed, just staring at the vastness of the cosmos juxtaposed to the smallness of, of my human mind, I, I wonder at how I can make confident pronouncements at all. We, I, am, am scandalously particular and limited and finite. Still, we might also say that there's a sort of religious sentiment here that, that, that Nietzsche's defiant affirmation of life, that his ability to, to stare this nihilism in the face and say, okay, uh, and still receive it as beautiful. This, this itself is a sort of religious posture. Indeed, I will, I will argue a sort of covert atheist version of pure actuality. Basically, the atheists are cheating a bit, but more on that in, in, at a future time. Uh, when the atheist option actually became a bit more popular among intellectuals in the 19th century, it is fascinating to know how much of it had a sort of aesthetic and existential appeal. Atheism could stare nature red in tooth and claw and yet simply wonder at its vastness, simply receive it in its most basic and unfiltered terms with, again, a, a simple gratitude that life was at all. Who cares where it comes from? Who cares if it's all just atoms banging together? It is! And, and what can one do but smile at this happy accident? Uh, the virtues required to appreciate this are, are honesty and bravery. It is the intellectually and existentially brave who can, who can work through these things. Uh, 
here we, we, we see the appeal of this viewpoint as not just intellectual honesty for its own sake, but perhaps an even slightly self-indulgent self-evaluation that I, you know, I'm able to take it. <laughs> this makes the, the view even more attractive. Not only do we see striving, but we feel a sort of pure and basic level of cosmic wonder and can feel the dignity of being honest and brave with reality as it coldly presents itself to us. It, it is indifferent, but, but we are those beautiful creatures who can speak back to it with love. Who cares if it, if it doesn't mean anything ultimately? Who cares if it's not founded on absolute truth? Th this posture is just felt to be a sort of joy for its own sake. It, it's a sort of freedom to be, to be lost in just the experience of wondering that there's anything at all. Again, I, I want to come back to this phenomenon later, but what I want to do for the moment is to allow us to admit to ourselves, if we dare, some degree of attractiveness about this option and a, an attractiveness which might be a bit self-indulgent and navel-gazing, sure, but cannot quite be reduced to these things. This is an important for what will become my critique because I don't think we can fully understand what is going on in modern atheism at its best unless we understand its aesthetic appeal as more than just the shallow stereotype of atheism means I can do whatever I want. Atheism is far more than that. Its fundamental ethic is, is one of, of honesty and a commitment to the affirmation of life at its, in its most basic fashion, or at least that's what it's historically been and what motivates a lot of current practitioners. We need not torture ourselves with all the odd particulars of dogma, but can simply affirm the simplest things, that we are here after all, and that we must make do on this terrestrial ship in a vast cosmic sea. Indeed, in its modern form, atheism tends to terminate in an ethic similar to that which we find in John Lennon's justly famous song, Imagine. And for all the ways in which, you know, we can and have critiqued the song in the past, you know, who isn't moved a little bit by a simple, pleasant melody, which presents to us its simple, pleasant vision of, a, of our potential as humans on this earth. I dare say it's, it's next to impossible for it to not to strike a little bit of a chord with us. You know, the brotherhood of man, a world in which people care more about the good of their neighbor than the privilege of their nation. But included for Lenin is uh, imagine there's no heaven which is not so striking, of course, as the next line, it's easy if you try. Uh, that latter line uh, renders it a modern song indeed. Perhaps some of you can already detect, as I again will discuss more in later videos, that this is all fundamentally a somewhat religious way of, of being an atheist. That sense that I can stare at the whole and say, whoa, <laughs> is not simply explained by God, but is irreducibly a religious posture. That before which we say, whoa, <laughs> in full Ke <laughs> Keanu Reeves fashion, is that before which, is that, uh, we, we say that before what we perceive to be bigger than us, that in which we're, we're caught up, grounded in, and uh, that which represents forces which transcend our ordinary experience, and in which indeed not to, put a too fine a point on it, give those experiences to us. One presumably liberating feature of this simple atheistic posture is its simplicity and clarity. In contrast to this, presumably, faith often feels like something we hold on to for dear life, but which ultimately eludes us. I recall a, a local convert from Roman Catholicism to agnosticism in the Maryland area, a guy named Greg, Greg Kreeble, who wrote about his story of becoming an agnostic. And as I recall, he used the image of his faith kind of losing steam. It was not that he didn't want to believe. He simply came to a point where he did not and could not. And despite his best efforts, he wrote as though he were effectively dragged into unbelief. And this is really not an uncommon phenomenon. I've, been, I've met many atheists who tell a similar story. Perhaps no one, though, better described this than one of the 20th century's great novelists, John Updike, toward the beginning of his In the Beauty of the Lilies. The Presbyterian minister, Clarence Wilmot, is described as feeling, quote, the last particles of his faith leave him. The sensation was distinct, a, a visceral surrender, a set of dark, sparkling bubbles escaping upward, end quote. Updike says later, Quote, Clarence's, Clarence's mind was like 
a many-legged wingless insect that had long and tediously been struggling to climb up the walls of a slick porcelain basin, and now a sudden impatient wash of water swept it down the drain. There is no God, end quote. <laughs> Clarence is, is stunned in this moment, and Updike elegantly continues, quote, life sounds all rang with a a curious lightness and flatness, as if a resonating bass beneath them had been removed. They told Clarence Wilmoth that he had what he had long suspected, that the universe was utterly indifferent to his states of mind, as empty of divine content as a corroded kettle. All its metaphysical content had leaked away, but for cruelty and death, which without the hypothesis of a god became unmetaphysical. They became simply facts, which oblivion would in time obliviously erase. Oblivion became a singular comforter. The cliff-like riddle of predestination, how can man have free will without impinging upon God's perfect freedom? How can God condemn man when all acts from Alpha to Omega are his very own simply evaporated? An immense strain of justification was at a blow lifted. The former believer's habitual mental contortions decisively relaxed. And yet the depths of vacancy revealed were appalling. In the purifying sweep of atheism's human of, of atheism, in the purifying sweep of atheism, human beings lost all special value. The numb misery of the horse was matched by that of the farmer. The once green ferny lives crushed into the coals fossiliferous strata were no more anonymous and obliterated than Clarence's own life would soon be in a wink of earth's tremendous time. Without biblical blessing, the physical universe became sheerly horrible and disgusting. All fleshly acts became vile rather than merely some. The reality of men slaying lambs and cattle, fish and fowl to sustain their own bodies, took on an aspect of grisly comedy, the blood-soaked selfishness of a cosmic mayhem. The thought, the thought of eating sickened Clarence. His body felt swollen in its entirety like an ankle after a sprain, and he scarcely dared take a step lest he topple from an ungainly height, end quote. I love especially this bit about his his new relationship to his body. And it would be interesting and fascinating to compare this to Updike's most more uh, famous and extremely medical poem on the resurrection of Christ with some really lovely lines about Jesus' kind of physical and uh, or physical resurrection. Uh, in any case, know what we see here. He Clarence, as Updike portrays him, doesn't, doesn't leave the faith. He doesn't refuse to believe. Faith and belief leave him the way strength leaves the body. His will is portrayed as no more involved in losing his faith than belief, in belief than it is in your will in affirming that I am right here right now. Uh, you, could, you could hardly disbelieve that you're hearing me right now, albeit via electronic medium, via an electronic medium, if you wanted to. And Clarence could not believe, even if he wanted to. And indeed, in the, in the novel, he, he, he laments this at several points. The world seemed utterly different than the claims of faith. And so faith, rather than unbelief, was rendered an act of will and stubbornness. And is this not how it can feel? That, that to believe is to sort of add something to the undeniable features of reality, the, the common banality that we always recognize. To, to suffuse the cosmos with agency and intention and personality is felt to be something I must try to see rather than what is obvious to me otherwise. And yet it was not always this way. We're, we're weird, and, but, but weird in common ways with our fellow men and women. What I want to do in the next video is to interpret why we are weird and how that helps deflate to the seeming plausibility of atheism. In short, I will argue that our problem is highly tied up with having plausibility structures that have been formed within the context of what I call late modern techno culture, or, or, or that sense of reality that has been formed in the mirror, as it were, of modern technology and its relationship to modern labor and culture. Uh, or said differently, let me, let me prompt you with this question. What does the modern world in its particular arrangement of technology, labor, and life prompt us in whole and in part to consider as real?
So, so stating that again, what does the modern world and its particular peculiar arrangement of technology, labor, and life prompt us in whole and in part to consider as real? Uh, what might persons shaped in just our context naturally think of concerning what it even means to say that a thing is real in the first place? To answer this, I would argue, relativizes any claim to automatically atheist implications from the problem of divine absence. Still, it does not get rid of the forces that craft our mental and imaginative habits in this direction. And therefore, in the, in the final video about this layer of the God question, I will suggest ways in which religious believers and seekers need to consider training themselves to be more attuned to all that we can know to be real in a more holistic way. So, so next time, a, a techno-cultural interpretation of why we're all so weird these days, and then in the final video on this particular layer of the God question, we'll talk about what we can do in light of that. But until that next video then, from, from one human cyber face to another, farewell.